Martin, thank you so, so much for, for sitting down with us. Um, we started this series called Voices of Football a little while back and we've gone through pretty much everyone. And your name was very much right there up at the top of our list of people that we wanted to speak to. And um, When you say gone through, that so, sounds a bit disarming, that. <laughs> In, in what way? In what way? <laughs> well, I just feel like it's like you filleted them, really. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, we, we, I hope I'm strong enough to withstand. Your, uh, yeah, yeah, they the fell questions. by the wayside. They were all finished commentating off the back of it. Um, and, and one of the main reasons why I wanted to, to sit down with you is because when I used to work at, at PLP back in the day, I remember you coming in on Monday nights and you were either with, uh, I think it was either Paul Walsh, or you or David Pleat, I remember you used to do with David Pleat as well. And you would come in and you would have a Bible. Like it was enormous, this this kind of handwritten notepad, but it was maybe A4 or even a little bit bigger than A4. Firstly, I wanted to know, do you still have it? And do you still amend it yourself? And why was it important to you to make your own notes and create your own style like that? I've tried to computerize it. Um, it's, it's not as big as you described, to be honest with it you. It was massive. You're, no, ma you're no. understanding I, I, it. I could give you commentators who have much more research than me. <laughs> but um, you always want to be prepared, you know. And there are so many what-ifs in a football match. And you try and imagine beforehand. You don't script it, but you think, well, what does it mean? I've just recently done the Liverpool game against West Ham at Anfield, where probably a lot of people thought that game was one-sided beforehand and I, I go well what if West Ham win and Liverpool lose you know you have to have that kind of process so so you're looking through when did they last win that actually you know, the terrible record four wins ever in the league at Anfield for West Ham so at 2-1 we thought we might really have a piece of history so you want to be aware of that that's just one tiny example of it um, but I have found um, obviously, I can use a laptop. People of my age are probably not very good at it, but I have learnt a lot more skills, mostly for my children, about how to uh, be a bit more technophobe about my job. But it's the old school prep principle. If you write it out, you remember it better, that, rather than keyboarding it out. That's the way, obviously, my mind's been trained down the years. So, yeah, I do a lot of, a lot of stuff, but I don't look at it very much. It's more like... Um, preparing for an exam and the game is the exam and you have to have it um, kind of written on the back of your hand or anything <laughs> like that. I wasn't like that at school. Um, but uh, you, you have to go through that process of trying to be ready for a situation in any one game where so many possibilities come out. What if he scores? What if he gets sent off? How many bookings have they got? Is it their birthday? You know. Um, who's got a cold. <laughs> we loiter in the tunnel before the game and that can be quite productive. The managers are more likely to talk to you a little bit um, when they're killing time themselves, having the teams getting prepared really without their, they've had their, their meetings with it and they're waiting for the kickoff. So there's so many variables. So you try and cover as many bases as possible. But actually when it happens, I mean, the one piece of advice I always give, I get asked by youngsters, what's it take to be a commentator? And it sounds so simple. But you understand the depth of what I say. Watch the game. Watch what actually is happening, not what you think is going to happen. So that's sort of, you sort of prepare like the players train, and then they have to go and play and respond to the situations when it happens. Have you felt a pressure to move with the game? You mentioned technology there with regard to people like starting to word process everything and then use social media. Have you felt a pressure to change your style at all? No, not at all. I mean, uh, I, actually, I don't do social media because that's the way I'm probably liable as anybody to have a knee jerk. And I'd rather keep that knee jerk to myself and <laughs> stay out of trouble. I, I do understand it. I do understand why people are on it, especially people who are maybe building their careers and they can connect so much more easily. All the connecting that I did would be face to face or phone numbers, you know, and that was the way it was done then. Um, so, so I have huge respect for the way the worlds move on. I, 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 I try to move with it myself, but the job's still the same. You identify players. Basically, that's what you do. That's the first thing. With television, you have to get that right. You then give some information, and you give the information, hopefully, at the relevant times. But that is such a difficult skill. You'll never get that right, but you try and remember that there is an appropriate time rather than forcing the information on the viewer. 
and then you try to interpret the game. But I'm sitting with the Gary Nevilles, the Jamie Carragher's, the Alan Smiths, people like that, Andy Hinchcliffe. I'm sitting with those people who, who do that. That's there to interpret the game. But I like to interact with that. And um, uh, whether it works is down to other people, really, but I still love doing it. I definitely want to come on to your, your uh, co-commentators in a bit, but you mentioned something that I think is really, really important is the idea of face-to-face -face contact with with managers or people that are working at clubs. And that is quite an old school thing, isn't it? I mean, it was something that used to happen a lot more, maybe well, 20, There were fewer years commentators, but fewer people demanding time of the, um, of the coaches and the players. Um, and it was a more of a connect. <laughs> when I started, you, after games, so you could see the journalists with their uh, trench coats turned up and their trilby hats in the car park where the players parked their cars. So they sort of doorstepped them as they came out. Some players stayed and talked, some, some didn't. It was, it's the same now, really. Some people like to be involved in the media and some people don't. So, yeah, it's, I do believe in getting to know people. I, I like to portray what little bit you can during a lively football match about... Like, I mentioned that game between um, Liverpool and West Ham. Robert Snodgrass and Andy Robertson played against each other, and they're great mates. You know, it's a really important game for both clubs. And there was a one real crunching tackle between them. And if you know they're great mates, then you can maybe bring a bit more out of it. So, and, and the people are, football is a great people. Football people are great people. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's not just a job, it's a pleasure to interact with them and, and have a bit of time and some of them play the computer game that I've been part of for a little while so that gives me a bit of an in and some of them just want me to say and it's live and sometimes <laughs> I do do that for them <laughs> so it's um listen it's it, it's part of a it's, it's a football's a force for good I believe that and in a world where there are so many differences it's a constant and I've not seen um, too much harm. Of course, in, in individual crises come out that would blow out, out of proportion on the day somebody says something about something. But actually, when you travel the world as a football person, you feel you're part of a big family in a way that I don't think you connect in too many other ways. Language isn't a problem, you know. Everybody knows a few football words in, in different languages. And, and once you identify somebody who's into football, whoever they are, wherever they are, you know, yeah, your blood brothers and sisters. I find it very reassuring, the idea of a Premier League player who is on ridiculous amounts of money still wanting to come up to you and ask you to say, and it's live. <laughs> it hasn't happened very often. It does happen <laughs> from time to time. The young ones, I think, before they get the ridiculous amounts of money. But listen, the money is not their fault. The money, that's the way the game's gone. We as television have brought a lot of money into the game. They should get the, what is the going right. It's a free market and, and I have no problem. I knew players just, I didn't know too many when the um, maximum wage was uh, in place, but I know those who've gone into football after that, become managers um, who played for 18 pounds a week, but they were playing in the fourth division, the old fourth division. And that was 18 pounds was the same you're getting at Manchester United in the first division. At least that's the way it was. And it reflects the changes in society. Things have moved forward. Um, and, and, and obviously, if industries are successful, then the earnings go up, you know, and, and football has been, it's been amazing how it's changed. And certainly the broadcasting side has changed from when I started, um, we had four cameras covering matches for highlights, you know, and the big match on ITV where I was working, regionally done slightly differently, but Sunday afternoons and match of the day on Saturday evenings, which is still there to its great credit. Um, that's what it was, and that's why when football came along as a lie, well, they were so terrified of it going live. The Football League, <laughs> terrified that it was going to, nobody would watch. And uh, um, I think they've been proved wrong as um, being part of it. You're part of it as a viewer, and in the ground you feel part of it. You're live on television, you're part of it. So the connect between live television and the game has been has been sensational really and I know there will always be those who say oh it's too much on you don't have to watch it it's there for those who want to watch it and there are millions who want to watch it and do you still feel like with with live football the same kind of passion and the mm. same fire for it that, that you always have well, I did oh, how many years before I did a live game 
seven or eight years that just wasn't on the agenda, especially as a young commentator starting out in either BBC or ITV, is ITV for me. And then gradually I got into World Cups where we had some live games. Um, and for me to be live is where and it's live came from, um, because it's very special. When you've done you know, 17 years, I think it was mostly of highlights, it's very special to be live and I've never lost that. Uh, also aware of the um, the challenge, you know. You, I sometimes sit there and think, they're going to say, so over to is Gary Neville and Martin Tyler. I'm going to talk for the next best part of the next hour, and I've got no idea really what I'm going to say. And you think that out of body experience, saying, how is this bloke going to do this? But somehow it happens. And let's just go back to you just mentioned over to Gary Neville and Martin Tyler. You've been quite fortunate with a number of, of, of brilliant co-coms alongside you. Could you just run me through some of the people that you've had and the people that you really clicked with? Everybody I click with because it's, I think it's my job to click. It sounds as though it's um, an issue. It's not, it's easy, it's football. We're together, we, we love football. So we're starting from a, a great point of view. I mean, I go back, I did the World Cup final for ITV in 1982 with Ian St. John, it was a great final. I did, the, I did the World Cup actually before that with England with Jack Charlton was an amazing experience whose knowledge was terrific and pronunciation not quite so good. <laughs> um, he called uh, Arcanada, the Spain goalkeeper, Anaconda. <laughs> it was a while before I was able to find the words to say, you know, um, he's not a man you who sort of went in to have an argument with away from the microphone, let alone on the air. Um, but great people and, um, you know, wonderful opportunity. I and mean, I'm sitting there with the World Cup winner. Ian St. John was, uh, you know, obviously a fantastic broadcaster as well as a, a great player in his time. I worked with Jimmy Greaves, who, you know, was probably as good as a goal scorer that I've ever seen in my life, you know, and then that sitting and talking to him like we're talking now, it's special. Anybody who's watching this has a hero, a football hero. And, you know, they say don't meet your heroes. I'd say the opposite. Meet as many of them as you can. You know, there'll be some odd ones that perhaps you meet at the wrong time. They're not quite what you expect, but most of them. In football, football's a very sharing community. And I think that's, that's reflected in the personalities as well. And for Sky, I mean, I have to, Andy Gray was, we did it back to front, really. Um, I'm supposed to be one that shouts and go and all that, and, uh, and the co commentator is supposed to just dissect it clinically, forensically. And I just did a bit of that, and Andy shouted, you bitty, <laughs> stuff like that. And uh, it worked, you know. Yeah, I do want to ask you about that early period, because for whatever happened after, that was groundbreaking, wasn't it, at the time, in terms of what, what it was doing? Yeah, yeah. It was like, um, I think we always described it as like going two mates to a match, you know? I think also we each had a microphone. I know this may be just folklore within the football <laughs> commentary community, but it used to be in the BBC days, one microphone, <laughs> and the main commentator wasn't very happy to pass it over to, so it was always going, in case a goal was gonna happen, you know, and the microphone was nowhere near you. So um, uh, I think that was the, that, that was, there hadn't been that much live, the World Cups and the England games and the FA Cup final, it hadn't been that much, so there wasn't, it wasn't as though we were rewriting a book, you know? We were just going off on an adventure, and it was an amazing adventure. I was just reminiscing um, earlier today that I've been on the train coming to see you from the north, and uh, we used to count the dishes, on the, and when we went through the towns, who got, who got the sky dishes up? Because obviously we were trying to not only change broadcasting, we, were, we, we, we had to make it work, you know? I'd forgotten it had, that. It had to be an economical um, work for, for, because um, Andy and I started together, at, um, it was called Champion Television, where uh, there was the square eel. It wasn't the dish that became, and Sky won that battle with the British satellite broadcasting and took them over, so the square oils went out. So, but that kind of, we, we, had, we had to take the public with us. It was no good having a dream job if nobody wanted to share that dream who was gonna to contribute to the coffers. Um, but a great team effort from everybody. I mean, I always say that one of the great things about working on a sports channel is everybody cares the same as you. When I worked for ITV, obviously the cameramen would be doing Coronation Street in the week and on the Saturday they'd do a football match. 
I remember one cameraman at one game saying, which one's Dalgleish? And I thought, we've got a problem here. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the kind of thing that you understood it, but you didn't necessarily like it. Now, they, they're, our, our technical guys uh, are fantastic. We're just stuck at the one, if you like, the public face of it, but a public voice of it in my case. But it's, um, it's a wonderful effort from people who are all as like-minded. And that's, we want to continue doing that. How far, um, you know, every, every year that need technological dimensions. Um, and now we've got VAR to deal with, which is not of our making, but very much of our, it's our cameras that get shown. So we, you, know, you never stop learning. Um, you, you mentioned, and you've mentioned this to me before, it's one of the things that stuck with me, the idea of having someone alongside you who is hugely energetic. In a situation like that, what is your role? And then... My role is to shut up. <laughs> and I, I do that quite well. You know, that's probably one of my great strengths, shutting up. Um, probably not as much as the viewers would like, but uh, admire, the rule was, and it's still there really, with, with the, the new generation of co-commentators who are fantastic. Um, is is the replay's theirs, you know? It's my job to say something. And then Gary and Cara and Smudger, they do that. Sorry, that's a bit football isn't it? That was brilliant, Gary, I love Gary that. Neville, <laughs> Jamie Carragher and Alan Smith. <laughs> and Andy Hinchcliffe, who we call Hinge sometimes, as in hinge and bracket, but you have to be a certain age to understand that joke. Um, they, um, they, they, they're ready to go. They've seen it, I've said, hopefully, the right goal scorer, and then they'll be on their way as the replay comes in. They'll know what the replay is going to... Anna Smith, in this game, uh, it's a good barometer because you know, the Liverpool-West Ham game, but Fornell scored off his calf. And, you know, that was a great spot before... He saw that in real time. You know, it looked like he swept it in, and he swept it. It was like, it was like a batsman playing down the right line, but not actually hitting it in the middle of the bat, you know? And it, it was a, looked like a very vital goal at the time, and certainly uh, um, West Ham deserved it. So that kind of observation, you know, that's what they're for. They've just got that little bit back from me. I'm a ball watcher, really. That's the way it has to be, because um, and they do the rest. On top of that, do you want the is it, is it the co-coms that provides the kind of the energy behind a big moment or do you feel a pressure to to bring it yourself because i remember you saying to me that it was sometimes nice with andy gray to, to, that he would he would sort of almost choose what level he wanted to peak at and then you would be kind of filling yeah, in what the audience I, might be missing I, I, that suits me to fit into the others i am very aware that they're all different um for, for me, I'm the constant. Obviously, Sky mix it all up with other commentators as well. But um, for my, in my chair, I, I'm obviously working with different people. I just want them to be happy because if they're happy, they'll they'll do a good job, and they do they do great jobs. Get yeah, energy sometimes. I think the moment the moment is. I get the moment first, to be honest with you. So I think you try and see history written before your eyes. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it. Maybe it's, it's quite an interesting debate as to. I feel I'm commentating for the neutral, and the fans will go, Well, you didn't shout loud enough on our goal. Well, well actually, you were 6 0 down at the time. You know, what am I supposed to do? Um, and I think we tried fan zone for, for a while, didn't we? And, and it's, it's a, for whatever reason, it hasn't been continued. But um, I try and editorialize it as it happens really that's a very inexact science but that's that's what you try to do and if it's a special moment hopefully you go to a place that you wouldn't normally be able to go you know the game takes you to a level where you find that extra yard if you like does that mean that you need to be sparing though with with those because if it's the first game of the season and someone scores a decent goal and you go huge at that point. Does it leave you with much wiggle room later well, on in the no, season? No, I don't, I don't think of it like that. I think of it within the context of the game. Um, if you go back and say, oh, we got really excited about that. Yeah, well, actually, that was the reason, because there's always, you know. Um, I think one of the hardest parts, one of the harder parts of it is if there aren't many away fans there and their away team score, and you haven't, the, the crowd noise doesn't take you naturally up to where it would do 
if the home team is 60,000 fans, you have to fight against that. The noise in the ground is much louder. So I think that's sometimes more of a challenge to get the, um, the moment right for, for the away team. And um, I'm, you know, I think about that. And, don't think about a lot of, in terms of you're, you're probing me in a way I don't normally have this kind of inquisition <laughs> so about really. what I do. I just do it, to be honest with you. But I think that's something that I have thought about in terms of the question you ask about about finding the right level for the right moment. But you know, you, it's football is. I was a wannabe centre forward. I was a non-league centre forward. Scoring goals was such a thrill for me that if anyone scores a goal, I'm thrilled for them. I, and we talked about VAR when I was commenting with Gary Neville recently, he's very pro the offside thing. And I said, go back and play because you're a defender, it'll suit you down to the ground. And I found myself speaking up for the forwards, though I have not the pedigree to do that. But we don't have many forwards. Alan Smith's the only one. I mean, in, in, on that day there was, <laughs> Uh, Jamie Carragher, Roy Keane, Jamie Redax, midfield player. They're, they're, none of them know really live about scoring goals. And I used to count all the goals I scored in the school playground, you know. And I like players like that. I like Shearer, who still thinks he got 261 Premier League goals. And there was one against um, Newcastle, which had gone down as a Wes Brown, for, uh, for Newcastle against Man United, which goes down as a Wes Brown own goal, which is definitely a Shearer goal. But we can't seem to mount a campaign to get him from 260 to 261. But I tell you what, if anybody gets close to 260, <laughs> he'll still be fighting for it. And he's right to do that as well. I, I, I really resonate with, we've got a young player at Woking who's 16. He's just been released by QPR, but he's come to our academy team and he's played a little bit in the first team. I asked him the other day, how many goals have you scored this season? 31. Those are the people, I like that, you know, I'm people who want to know, who know that, so there you go. Final question on your code comms, and I'm really going to put you on the spot. But when your call sheet comes through, who is the name that you are looking to see alongside you? Honest answer? Yes. I never look. Really? I never look. We get um, picked by different producers. Uh, the head of sport does the commentary rotor, head of football does the commentary rotor, Gary Hughes. And one of his producers, Billy McGinty, does the co-comments. So I, I never know. Um, we might talk. Oh, I see you. What, when will I see you at the next? Are you, they look. And they get their rotors before me. So they. I don't. I never know where I'm going till about two weeks beforehand. I, I, it never matters to me. I'm just pleased to see any of them, and they. And I really mean that. It's that they. I can't think of anybody, and I've commented down the years with a lot of different people, I can't think of anybody that I go, because we love football, and they've, they've, they've done something in football that I haven't usually, always. And, and, um, and then we talk. And Gary and I talk a lot about non-league football because obviously Salford have come through. We played Salford five times, at, uh, three times at Hampton and Richmond, and twice at Woking. And we've, we've, I've won two, he's won two, and there's been one draw. And, uh, you know, we, that's kind of a bond away from, yeah. away from what we're there to do. And there are times where I go, well, we've got a Premier League game to turn it off. But... Um, do you get bragging rights then? No, no. In, you can't brag in football. You <laughs> cannot. There's always another game. You can't brag. And, and I'm, I'm a great believer in that. I'm a great believer in the etiquette, the way that, you know, players... Mostly, the battle of sins and final whistle goes, handshakes, and I think that's really important. And I think etiquette between the dugouts is really important. Um, and I've learned that through being in dugouts myself for the last 15 years, as well as being on gantries. So I, 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 there's, there's no bragging rights for me. I'd, I'm just lucky to be involved. Commentator, coach, player for a little while, fan, it's just... It's just amazing. I mean, I think I'm 25 and, you know, you could probably not far away from adding 50 years to that. So, and it's still touch wood going, just about. That's really fascinating you say that because uh, Barry Davis said to us that one of the things that really irked him was diving because he said it's something that didn't exist and he's seen the emergence of it. So for you, something like 
seeing managers behave poorly on the touchline, is that something that grabs your attention? Because you obviously have got a little... Uh, some yeah, I, I'm not saying in 15 years, it might be people watching this who say, well, I remember when we played, you know, in the <laughs> Rhino League or something like that. It's there you are, it's storming onto the It's pit. a passionate game. It's a passionate <laughs> game. And um, I do think that... Um, one little story, we, I was at Hampton Richmond, we played Staines local derby. In the 90th minute, we equalised and the left back scored. And I was in the dugout on the side, at our attacking side, and so he celebrated in the corner. I ran from the dugout and joined in the celebrations. I wasn't sent off, but the ref said, I want you to go behind, behind, and, and in fact, you know, just... Um, not you can't stand right behind the dugout, but, but I wasn't disciplined or anything for it. Three weeks later, Ronald Koeman does the same when uh, Southampton were two 0 down home to Liverpool, one three two. He doesn't get any any, any trouble <laughs> at all. And I go well, and I saw I, I spoke at the referee's end of season do that that year, and um, I said, "Is the ref in the room?" Who again? And. Um, who was it? So Roger East, I think, refereed the um, Koeman game. I said, Roger, you're there. I see you there. Did you do anything? Did you report Koeman? No, no, no. I said, anyway, I'm walking around. So it's 1-1, one, one, right? I'm walking around behind the goal because I, I think I'll go to the dressing room. I'll just get away from it. So there's a few seconds to go. 1-1's one, a good result. Way to stay in for us. What behind our supporters, uh, I was behind the goal. And behind the goal, we score again. And we win 2-1, and I'm in, in the middle with the fans. So the ref, the ref did me a massive favour. I wouldn't have been able to share that. So I'd shared one with the players, which I wasn't supposed to do, and one with the fans, which, which was a special moment, really. And we won 2-1. So, um, yeah, it's... Um, but that, that's... I wasn't behaving badly. I just came out of the technical area. You're not supposed to do that, really. But I understand it. I think, I think that's, that's perhaps what... I don't like to equate... Very rarely the my world as a coach and my world as a commentator collide. We we got to the third round of the FA Cup, we played Watford live on BT. That color, that was a collision day, that was at Woking um, the season before this one. And um, that was weird. That was really weird. I was trying to get the team. I mean, that's my job to get the teams from managers as a job. Now it's I can't really do it because I'm not a commentator. I can't go <laughs> that I'm the rival coach to Javi Gracia. <laughs> And um, some, somebody, an ex-professional player who's a good friend of mine, I won't stitch him up on the camera, he said, do you want another Watford team? I said, yeah, come on. So we, we found it, we found it out. Brilliant. Yeah, so, um, so but yeah, I, I, I think I played for Corinthian Casuals. You've heard the expression of Corinthian spirit. It was true. I mean, when I played, it was beginning to come to an end. I didn't know you played for Corinthian yeah, Casuals. Yeah, yeah. And um, yes, it, uh, it, when, when, if you got sent off, you were really thrown out of the club. Wow. when I started, but it, it didn't, it sort of moved with the times. The game was changing and, the, and, they, and they abolished uh, the season I finished, they abolished the distinction between amateurs and professionals. So, you know, it, it sort of allowed some of the old values to maybe be swallowed up by a realisation of what the new game was about, what the game was about then, I knew it was a long time ago. So, um, but I do, there's no, there's no thrill in winning in any walk of life, but especially football is my life, if you do things wrong, you know, if, if something that's a bit underhand, you might win, you might, you might, something might work for you, and it's not happened, whichever way it happens, I'm not saying I've ever been party to anybody cheating, but if something goes for you, you think, it's not the same feeling. The feeling of winning is wonderful. You don't want it tainted by, not sure about that, you know. So, um, but it is an amazing feeling to win, and, and I think that's what I share with the players that I commentate with. They, they're winners, they're real winners. They've really won, you know. I've done a little bit in the coaching, but not, not as a player, I hardly won anything. Um, but I've got a few medals now, which is it's nice, you know. That's really nice. Yeah, one, one, yeah, it is. Um, I, I must ask you, what are the, the moments that you look back on and that you, enjoy thinking about because I'm so Peter Drury who we also spoke to mm. he told a really great story about you being on a train to Manchester following the season following the Aguero moment he said people came up to you and said thank you for the Aguero go and he said that he said to you that, that it's almost like you had scored it that they were they were like thanking you for that goal I wish I'd scored it <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, it's Sergio's moment. It's Sergio's total moment. I've never spoken to him. It's always, it's, as each year goes by, I think I'm more reluctant to, to, to even have that moment because it was his. You know, I just hung on to it by its coattails, really. I was, I was the live broadcaster for the, obviously, for the United Kingdom, and there were a lot of other broadcasters. They're all on YouTube, all the different commentaries of the day, and they're all very good. But I was the one, I suppose, um, I was the rights holder, if you like, on the day. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's nice to be. I mean, two years later, a Man City fan chased me out of the car park. At, I, I ended up chasing him out of the car park. He said, two, two years later, City won the league again. I beat West Ham at home, and Liverpool played Newcastle the same day. He came up to me and said, um, oh, he must be gutted. Two years, this is 2014, two years after Aguero. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you lot all want Liverpool to win the league. I can't, what are you talking about? We don't have any personal <laughs> views at all. I'm a Woking fan. What, what, so, what, so, oh, he, he, he did and everything. And I said, come here. And he, he went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's two years afterwards, and, and that City fan thought I wanted Liverpool to win the league. And when you look back on moments like that, yeah, it, it's, it is amazing. I mean, there have been four or five great moments that great commentators have been attached to. I've been doing the job um, 30... How many years? 38 years, something like that. And finally, I had, my, I had a moment where the game was there and I was attached to it. You know, the Brian Moore, I was with Alan Smith recently, Brian, when Alan scored and, and then Michael Thomas scored at Anfield. It's up for grabs now and all that. So Kenneth Wilson home, some people are on the pitch, they think it's all over. You know, it's one, they're wonderful moments. But you have to be at the game where it happens, you know, you can't manufacture it. If it's a 5 0 win, you know, you, you, you know, and there's nothing at stake. So you, yeah, it just fell my way, really. And it's, it, yeah, it's, of course, it, but it's humbling, to be honest with you. That's what it is. And as one ex manager said to me, I can't use the exact words, but substitute mess for a word that you might imagine he would say, at least you didn't mess it up. And I think that's probably the greatest feeling about it. All commentators are terrified of getting it wrong on the big moment. And it was, it was okay. It was okay. The silence was golden. That's what most people say to me. Why did you keep quiet? And I went, well, it was, Mark Hughes was the manager of um, Queen's Park Rangers that day. I saw him the next night. It was the manager's dinner in London. And uh, he said, well, I said, well, amazing. And he said, it's the noisiest in a football ground I've ever heard. Mark Hughes played for Man United, Barcelona, Bayern Munich, and managed all over the world with the national team and in the Premier League. He said it was the noisiest football moment he'd ever experienced. So, uh, if I had said anything after the O's, um, you know, no one would have heard it. And that's, you know, yeah, it's, it's nice, but I don't look back. You asked me to look back. I, you can only do this job by looking forward. And I've got a cup final to come, and um, I need to get that right. You know? How do you get yourself into the mindset for a cup final, um, having done so many, and internationally and uh, domestically, across a load of different competitions? How do you get yourself up for the next one? It's not any different to any other game. It, I guess you think it might be, but it isn't. Every game you do as a commentator, you're live, every live game that you do, you're at the mercy of your own faculties, to be honest. Your observational skills, your vocabulary skills, anything else, your relationship with your co-commenter skills. So every game's like that. And no matter, there will be more people maybe watching a cup final and listening. There's always somebody watching and listening, whatever game you do. So you've always got an audience and you've always got to respect that audience and it is no different. Every game is, it's, it's like playing, you can't half measure it. You go to play, you prepare to play. Well, the players will be playing in a cup final. Maybe it'll feel a bit different then because there's a different environment. There's a trophy at stake. There's no trophy at stake for us any different than there is for every game. For Sky Sports, to whom I owe an enormous amount, the trophy is coming away from it and said, they'll say, well done, that's okay. That's for me, that's all that, that all I, I want from it, that I haven't let anybody down, that I've maybe not annoyed the audience, and that I've got the main thrust of it. I, 
after games, I, I like to read the papers the next day to see whether the storylines are similar. I wonder today um, in the papers that I've been reading about the, the last game that I did, and uh, it was good. The connection was good between our editorialising and, and what the journalists think. So that's, that's it, really. You're never going to please everybody. It's hard enough to please yourself. In fact, it's almost impossible to please yourself. Like every commentator, I'm sure, has, has said that because we're all of a kind. We are a fraternity. We, we know each other inside out, really, and we have really boring conversations about, oh, have you seen so-and-so? He's dyed his hair. Be careful. <laughs> and uh, I learned something from Danny Higginbottom, actually, which I, 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 many years, four decades of doing this, he taught me something. He goes by the color of the boots. And my, my, mind you, when I started, all the boots were black <laughs> until quite recently. But he, he spends, I've done games with him. He, he goes through, when the players come out for the warm-up, he, he goes through and he goes, where's so and so? I haven't got his country. He writes the colours of the boots. I've used a bit of that. John Stones wears orange boots. Well, he did. He has been wearing them. And it's sometimes in the middle of a back four, you know, so we, it really helps. So there's a tip for yeah. all, all the others. That perhaps, that perhaps the others do it, but I hadn't done it. I, I was just thinking then when you sort of mentioned the idea of hoping that you do a good job in terms of how people would think about the comms and then only briefly reading back afterwards, I wonder whether the reason why people come up to you and would be say something like, "Oh, I bet you wanted Liverpool to win or whatever," is because they they're almost on some level crave your words for for their for their win because you've been synonymous with so many big moments. That there's almost like a trust between you and the audience that the audience trust you to deliver a big line at a big moment because you've done it so many times before. And so even though it might sound a bit ludicrous that they would come and say that sort of thing, it's almost on some level flattering. Is that in any way accurate? Listen, I never have any problem talking about football to anybody as long as they're polite. And even the guy in the tell you in the 2014 story, I mean, I was more angry with him than he was with me, to be honest. I'm like, how can you say that? And, and it does, the, the, one of the worst thing that I get asked all the time, and I go, I think people have finally realised and done their research that they realise I am a, a working fan since 1953, which is quite a long time. And, and only the Queen and I have been going since 1953, I think. <laughs> um, and and they, they go, but, oh, yeah, but you must have a Premier League team. And I go, why? <laughs> and that really does get my goat, because why must I have a Premier League team? Because, you know, I, the only result when I'm working elsewhere that I, I look for is Woking. That's been the case all my career. Um, and it's just the way my life panned out. I, I, I total respect for those who've taken to their local old first division team or whatever it was. I mean, most of the commentators, and you've mentioned some of them today, their teams are, by chance, Premier League teams. Um, sometimes they weren't. They've gone to be in the Premier League. Um, working still trying to get in the football league. So. And they've been, well, they couldn't do it in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but they could do it now. Um, so, I, I, I don't mind what people think. I can't create, you can't go out to please people f if you think I've got to say that for that. Sure. I have no issues with people saying, oh, I don't think you did that or why did you do that. I, I can always, ha sometimes about things I never even thought about, I go, well, perhaps it was because of this, you know. Um, and 99.9% uh, .9 of people who do that are, Charming. They want if they want a selfie, and then they go, "Oh, you support Man United or something like that." <laughs> I have a laugh at that. People who I'm perhaps with at the time go, "Does that really happen?" I said, well, "It does sometimes." Um, <laughs> basically, it's uh, it's it's a job that takes you into the public domain. In a way, it's sort of anon anonymous because obviously you're a voice, and you can see why I'm a voice, and not a face. And uh, it is definitely. It's definitely, um, that, that's sort of because we do, uh, Sky, I, I don't do social media for my own name, but I, for Sky I do, I do the, the teaser, the question that we do to camera, we've been doing it for seven or eight years now, and that creates an interest as well. You know, people, oh, I'm still looking for one for the answer for last week. <laughs> that's a nice way to interact. Listen, it's, it's a, football's a wonderful world, and uh, growing up, I just love watching it and, and then learning to play it. And, and I never, ever thought that I'd be having a conversation in my 70s 
with a brilliant young journalist like you trying to describe what what it means and how it sort of got there it's just got there you know and it's got there for one reason alone which you share and i'm sure other people in the room share we love football we love it and yeah you could say it's, it's wrong to say it's a drug because drugs are not all good for you and and you know it's it, it's just something that's in your skin Mick Shannon, a great player who I worked with on ITV when he, did, he became a panelist in the World Cups, he said, it's a thing you can't scratch. <laughs> and it is, the itch is always there. You don't want to scratch it. You just want to just enjoy it. And, and that's all I've done. And it's, the years have gone by, you know, and, and I've, 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 the love has kept me going through some difficult times. It's not all been sweetness and light, I promise you. Um, and most times after a game, it's angst rather than, you know, very rarely do that. You very rarely do that. Um, so it, the traveling's hard. You get the best seat in the house. You work with wonderful people. And footballers go, have you actually met so-and-so? Yeah, well, it's just a They're great, the footballers of today, by the way. They're great. They're, they're schooled at the clubs from a young age how to deal with coming into the adult world as footballers, but the adult world as personalities as well. They're fascinating individuals with all backstories that you could actually go on forever in a, in a, a game to talk about and you don't have the time to talk about. And you should interview them. They're much more interesting than me. <laughs> no way. No way. Just tell me finally, is that love of football unconditional? And is it everlasting? Like, will you carry on commentating just until you get to a point where you, you can't do it anymore? Certainly everlasting. It's not unconditional because it's not faultless. And unfortunately, there is a limit um, that you can talk about because of laws of obviously slander and libel and all that. You, you can't. There are things about the game that I don't like. I remember Gareth Southgate, when he got the job permanently for England, I, I said, the game is wonderful, the industry not so wonderful, something like that. And there's a, there's a bit about that. The, the people who influence the game that don't love football, I can't connect with, and I find that hard sometimes, but they're people who, some of whom might govern whether I work or not, so you have to live with it. But um, no, it's, but it's, it's there. Rightly or wrongly, forever and a day. <laughs> Football, I love you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so, so much. That was such a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew.